Hi, Technation Editor John Wall is here. I'm excited to be with you today as we learn more about the tools of the trade featured in the March issue of Technation Magazine, the pro par or proactive par from Cognosis. Thank you to today's sponsor, Cognosis. Cognosis delivers real-time location services to healthcare facilities, enabling them to rapidly deploy room-level accurate location services with proven ROI. Cognosis leverages artificial intelligence and long range and long range networking technology to eliminate complex, costly, and hardware heavy RTLS installations. Instead, providing an ultra lightweight, highly accurate solution that delivers value on day one. For more information, please visit cognosis.com. That's C O G N O S O S.com. In today's Tool of the Trade live demo, presenter Bill Houghton, Vice President of Sales and Business Development, will demonstrate how to avoid wasting time searching for clean equipment with ProPAR room level accuracy. Combined with AI powered location engines, it makes it easier than ever for Biomed and Central Stereo teams to optimize the management of mobile medical equipment. Clean and soiled rooms self monitor and self report asset levels automatically generating replenishment notifications and pick list. This simplifies, this simplifies asset management by saving time and ensuring teams focus solely on areas that require immediate replenishment. An easy to read dashboard presents a summary of asset availability and PAR level metrics. Please note that the presenter has provided a PDF handout for attendees. The handouts are accessible via the, well, the webinar dashboard. Before we begin, I want to remind attendees that today's presentation is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI. One hour after the end of today's broadcast, you will receive an emailed survey. Completing that survey will grant access to a certificate that you can download and print from your desktop. We will wrap up today's broadcast with a Q&A session. Please note that the webinar dashboard includes a question feature. You can submit your questions for our presenter at any time during the demo. And I am very excited to share that this year we are celebrating Webinar Wednesday's, Webinar Wednesday's 10th anniversary. As part of the celebration, during today's demo, we will be giving away a pair of Apple AirPods to an attendee who can answer the following trivia question. Cognosis, our sponsor today, is headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. What is the Atlanta NBA team called? Answer now using the question feature on your dashboard, and we will reveal the answer at the end of the webinar. Stay tuned to find out if you are the lucky winner. Also, Technation Magazine is excited to announce that we are taking applications for our third annual 40 Under 40 powered by YP at MD. We are looking for HDM professionals who are under the age of 40 who have done amazing work for the biomedical industry. Applications are due by April 26. You can apply at onetechnation.com and look for the 40 under 40 nomination form. Now, today's presenter is Bill Houghton, Vice President of Sales and Business Development. Bill, you may begin whenever you are ready. Well, thank you very, uh, thank you again. Um, I uh, couldn't have said that much better myself, uh, that intro, that was great. So happy to be here with Technation again. Um, so I'm gonna uh, break presentation today into two parts, few slides that lead into it, and then we're gonna go live and have a look at our demo environment and have a look at uh, power replenishment in the demo environment. Um, please feel free to shoot questions across um, as uh, as the webinar goes on, and uh, we'll answer if we can. We'll answer them in the course of the presentation. Otherwise, uh, we'll circle around to them at the back of the presentation. So, I'm going to lead off with why do you need a tracking system? Um, you know, it's it's really interesting when you talk to people about why they need a tracking system and all the reasons they come up with that um, we need to know where equipment is, right? All of these are relevant, you know, nurses are searching for equipment. We lose a lot of equipment every year out through, you know, who knows how it goes missing. Um, you know, we, uh, we're concerned about equipment not getting cleaned properly. 
we seem to buy more equipment. We should have as we should have plenty of infusion pumps, but we don't seem to, and we don't know why. So let's buy more. Um, in fact, any time nursing thinks they're running out of equipment, you know that's the that's the reaction for ten plus years now. You know that's what we've done is buy more and and help that hope that solves the problem. But if you condense all this down and have a look at what the underlying problem is. There's one key underlying problem to address that solves so many other issues in the hospital, and that is that we need to distribute clean equipment more efficiently. Um, that's the underwriting issue here, right? So we need to leverage tools that help us do that, uh, not just try a, a bunch of different search techs, technologies or connected devices or something like that to solve it. But we need to focus on the problems of distributing clean equipment and the challenges in a hospital environment of doing that efficiently. So that's what today's discussion is about. Equipment distribution process improvement. Understanding where we're at today and what are the tools we can use to improve that as we move forward. So this is not going to be new news to anybody on the call today. If you talk about, if you talk to any of the care providers, any of the nurses on the floor, and you ask them about mobile medical equipment, their biggest challenge, their single, um, you know, number one concern is that there's a shortage of equipment. And when there's a shortage of equipment, they have to run off and search for and try to find something to provide care. Um, 20 minutes to an hour a shift, depending on which report you want to run and, and read, um, it's a lot of time taken away from providing care, right? So, you know, number one problem, we just don't seem to have enough equipment. So what do nurses do? to solve that problem? Well, they start hiding equipment, they start hoarding equipment. Um, if they're not confident they can get a PCA when they need it or an SCD when they need it, they're going to stash one away. And, and, and hoarding only exacerbates the problem. If I've got a hundred pieces, a hundred PCAs in circulation in the hospital and 25 get hidden away, now I'm trying to serve pretty much the same clinical need with less equipment. Now I've only got 75 pieces that are in circulation. So it, it's a, it's, you're going down the rabbit hole, it gets tougher and tougher. Nurses don't have enough equipment or feel that they don't have enough equipment. They hide some equipment, there's less equipment, they hide some more equipment. Um, in the end, what happens, the hospital spends, uh, you know, capital dollars, they shouldn't be spending on equipment they don't really need, right? Of course, the other issue with hoarding is it puts you at risk. Um, you have um, uh, uh, equipment that doesn't go through circulation, um, that may be up for a PM, it doesn't get PM properly, or a recall, or an update, a software update, cleaning protocols, you know that when Joint Commission walks in, they're going to find that particular device in a nurse's drawer somewhere, and that, uh, that raises a lot of questions, and that's something we're trying to avoid. So what are we trying to do? The challenge is to ensure that the right piece of equipment is in the right place, in the right state, at the right time. That's the challenge. We need to make sure we can have clean equipment that's ready, um, service, PM, all those other things that go into having an available piece of equipment. We need to make sure that any time a care provider goes looking for a piece of equipment, they can find a clean piece of equipment. If we get that right, there's no need to hoard. There's no need for giving the nurses a search tool um, because all they'll ever need to do is walk to the clean room on a particular floor and the piece of equipment they're looking for is going to be there. 
And I, I touched on this earlier, but the downstream impact of not getting this right affects all parts of the hospital. So it could be a, an OR case or any case delay where I don't have the infusion pump I need to start the case. Um, clinical care on the floor, of course, we spoke about that. So time to clinical care, getting, uh, getting into the room with the patient providing care. Med surge floor, obviously important, but when you're in the ED and you're in trauma, um, these delays are, you know, minutes are critical. So not having equipment really can impact the, the outcome, the patient outcomes, because we're not getting to the patient in a timely manner. Nursing satisfaction. First thing you're going to hear from nurses, like I said before, is they're frustrated about not having equipment, not being able to do their job, which is provide care, right? Um, so, you know, you get decreased nursing satisfaction, they're complaining about it. it, it may even impact nursing retention and at the moment we're all trying really hard to ensure that we retain the nurses we have with the shortage that, we've, that we're, we're working through. Um, that relationship between the floor and biomed slash equipment transport or SPD or materials management, you know, all the departments that are involved in getting a piece of clean equipment to the floor, um, it's those angry phone calls that come down all hours of the day because there's not a piece of equipment when I need it. I need it now. I need to get, you know, this piece of care done. I need to get this case started. It's an uncomfortable relationship we want to solve. Poor utilization of equipment, you don't seem to have enough equipment because utilization of equipment that you have is really poor. So there was a few studies that have been done on this. Um, we've seen it measured in the low 40 percentile for regardless of the piece of equipment. It, it is just nowhere near running efficiently. If it was anything except healthcare or any other industry, um, this would be a major issue that they were solving. 40% utilization of you know, expensive pieces of equipment is too low. Um, hoarding we spoke about, of course, anytime somebody comes into the facility to in do an inspection, any piece of equipment they find that hasn't been going through cleaning properly or hasn't been serviced recently or updated, or if there's any concern about it being cleaned, um, that's a violation that starts to get expensive. So before I step into the tool, the prerequisite of getting this right is accuracy, high confident, accurate tracking facility wide. You need to cover the whole building. You need to cover the whole building equally as accurately as a patient room. So we call that unique space. You need to be unique space accurate. You need to be patient room accurate, procedural area accurate, hallway accurate, stairwells, lobbies, open spaces. Um, you need to have that degree of accuracy everywhere. It, it, it's not enough to just cover patient rooms, but not the hallways and the open spaces, right? So, you know, you can't, you, you can't, distribute or automate equipment distribution properly if the endpoints aren't all in the system. So equipment in a alcove, you, you have to be able to count that. You, if you're responsible for refreshing that, you have to be able to count that, even though it's in a hallway, in an open space. Um, wheelchairs in the vestibule outside of the emergency department, classic example, right? Uh, large open space, glass everywhere, uh, but we want to count wheelchairs. We want transport to know when we are short of wheelchairs at the front door. So you need to be unique space accurate everywhere. Um, monitoring all the exit points, of course, it's a, and it affects the impact on reducing equipment loss. And you need to do this cost effectively, uh, of course. So. We're going to step into um, a, a demonstration of the ProPAR tool that with the introduction. 
Um, this is a tool that allows you from anywhere in the hospital, uh, from at your desk, uh, doing your normal task in the day to understand what is where the equipment is and what the next step in the workflow is anywhere in the building. And we start with monitoring sold rooms because to get clean equipment distributed efficiently into clean equipment rooms or nominated clean areas in the hospital, you need to be picking up sold equipment efficiently. The more efficient you're doing that, the more equipment is in line for cleaning, the more equipment comes out of that queue into the general holding area for distribution to the floor. So we start with knowing what is in every sword room in the building and sending an alert when things are requiring for pickup. And then of course, par level in the clean rooms, knowing what the clean room par levels are and what the current status of every room is. Um, providing simple pick lists, alerting when a room needs attention. And then the final thing, um, which I'll show you is, that anytime you ask somebody to manually document something is a point of failure. So when you use this system and you deliver clean equipment into a clean room, there's nothing to document. It's all set on automatic. You walk in, you leave the equipment in the room, you walk out, close the door behind you. You don't have to think about it anymore. That room is going to reset automatically. Um, so you're not on the hook to document what you put into that room or count what's in that room. Okay. Okay, so I have just switched over to our live demo environment um, from the PowerPoint and I'm gonna drag, this is my phone, we're running my app and um, uh, I'm just getting it cast to the screen so I can show you what's happening both in the platform and on my phone at any given time. So this is the visibility board. Um, you see it when you log into the portal, you can have a big board sitting in biomed or equipment distribution. Uh, I can see at a quick glance at the board, what needs urgent attention um, in the building, what is getting low in equipment, and then all the rooms that are at stock or close enough to being restocked. So let's start with F2 Clean Utility. Being red is because at least one asset class in the room is at critically low levels. So there are three measurements in the room. There is a re, I'll show you that in a sec. I thought that might pop up. I jump into the room. I'll jump into the room. Move that out of the way for a sec. So you can see that in fusion pumps in F2, we have set at five for uh, what we call 100%. So that's the restock level. Anytime you are given, um, uh, you look into the room and you are given a pick list to restock the room, it's gonna restock to 100%. Now 100% is a little misnomer because of course you could put six in the room, but um, that's what your pick list will show. And you'll see in this room that one category has, is red and that makes the room red. Um, if, uh, if I jump out of there, if we look over here at F2 Clean Utility in the ED, it's yellow because one of the asset classes is yellow. So I have critical is red, warning is yellow, and green is restocked. Every room naturally is unique in your hospital. So what assets should be found in the room will vary, whether you're in the ED or the OR or L&D, PICU, the med surge floors, anywhere in the building, those rooms are going to be different. So every room is configured for 
specifically for that area. Um, what assets should be in the room, what the counts are. The emergency department clearly has a larger restock count than some other areas of the hospital. So every room is going to be unique. So when I am, uh, I'm sitting, uh, doing my day job, I might be doing a PM on a piece of equipment, cleaning equipment, moving a patient around a wheelchair, a room goes to red and my phone is going to buzz at me to let me know that there is a room that needs attention. And so I can open my phone up, uh, see that I've got a couple of rooms that are in red, I've got some yellow rooms, and then everything that's green gets deprioritized and sits at the bottom of the list. By opening my phone up, I haven't even moved from my desk yet. I can look in the room and I can see exactly what that room needs to restock. Uh, I can see this here, of course. I need three infusion pumps and two syringe pumps. Here's my pick list on my phone. So without visiting the room, without somebody calling me from the room, without nursing um, politely calling me to tell me we're out of equipment, uh, I know exactly what that room is going to need to be brought back to stock. Now, yeah, um, the, the uh, infusion pumps are the low category here, but if I'm going to go there, I might as well restock the room to its entirety. So I get my pick list, I grab the assets that I need. Um, the pick list is purely just to help me remember what I need. Once I've got that equipment, I'm heading out to F2, my phone goes in my pocket, nothing else that needs to be done and I leave the equipment in the room, walk out, and that room will recount and it will drop into green. And all I have to worry about then is the prioritized rooms at the top of the list. So I'm going to ED, I might drop past the sword utility on F2. I know I've got some things to pick up there. Let's have a look at that on my phone, sword utility. So here is the equipment in the sword utility room that I need to pick up. So is it just a few items? Is it a lot of equipment that needs two of us to go and grab? Again, without leaving my desk, I can see everything needs to be done in this room. So um, really quickly, I can jump into the room. I was showing that earlier on. Uh, sorry, go, we'll go over here instead. And uh, I can manage assets up and down. So the critical part of this uh, implementation is getting this right. And it's a challenge. Um, now that I know where all the equipment is, now that I've got an efficient team of people visiting rooms as required, uh, I am going to get more equipment in circulation than we've seen in many, many, many years. And uh, so, you know, the par levels in those areas, they are all going to be affected. And if you have some idea of what that par level should look like, um, that's definitely where we're going to start. But in the first 90 days, our team, um, with your permission, actually monitors and manages these rooms, making adjustments on the counts in the rooms so that we're not alerting too frequently or we're not alerting not at all. I, having a clean room that only alerts once every two weeks is essentially a storeroom. Um, all that equipment is not contributing to providing care in the hospital. So those counts are too high. Having to restock a room four times a day means I have set my restock levels too low so we need to adjust that up so maybe it's five we might move that to eight and so we're going to help you monitor that and fine tune that in so we can get the best circulation out of equipment in the building so bouncing back to my powerpoint so that's pretty much it the tool is you know i Got a lot of engineers making the tool look really simple and work really simply. Um, at the end of the, the process there, I, I showed this in a PowerPoint slide, hard to do this in real time. Um, 
I restock the clean utility room, it automatically drops down to a green status on the down on the bottom of my phone now, and I've only got one other red room to go and address. So what what are we trying to achieve in all of this? If you're looking at tracking at RTLS, right? Um, the goal, if you narrow it down and really look at the core problem that affects so many parts of the hospital is this 100% availability of clean equipment on the floor, right? It's This is a confidence game. You get this right, nurses know that every time they walk to that door for the clean room and they're looking for PCA or an SCD or breast pump, they're going to walk in and open the door and I don't know how they do it. It's magic. But every time I walk in here, there's a PCA in here when I need it. And that confidence is what changes behavior. I haven't met a nurse yet who wants to clean their own equipment, PM their own equipment, be responsible for that piece of equipment, right? Um, they do that because it's a symptom of a larger problem. So we can solve that. We can solve that by automating the process and getting 100% of clean equipment on the floor. So what happens when you get that right? All the other things I spoke about, well, you get better availability of equipment. You have more equipment sitting available now than you've ever had, which means I have a lot of idle inventory or excess inventory. 15%, this is, I've been measuring this, this outcome for years, this 15%, minimum 15% increase in equipment availability means you're doing the same amount of clinical work you're doing before with less equipment because it's in circulation. I can start pulling equipment off the floor, moving it to a sister facility, avoiding a purchase that's coming up. Um, I lose a few pumps this year, a couple fall down, you know, uh, stairwells and break into so many pieces, I can't repair it. I'm not buying replacements, I'm dipping into excess inventory. So for the next three to five years, the hospital will not be buying these incremental replacements or incrementally adding to inventory because we'll know where everything is and we'll know where to get it, where to find it, and exactly what we need and exactly what's excess. We lock it behind a door there. We know it's there, didn't move it, but it won't be used, won't need it to be used and nobody on the floor will know any difference other than I always seem to have a clean piece of equipment. We monitor equipment. So again, while we're there, we're on site. So, you know, one of the areas, a big area of equipment losses in trash and laundry or sword laundry, transfers out of the ambulatory uh, exit. So we help reduce this system implemented properly, help reduce loss from stolen equipment. Not 100%, never gonna pretend it's 100%. There's deliberate theft. Uh, there's accidental theft when a patient takes something home with them. You'll never stop it all. Um, you are just not going to um, swat a, a patient at discharge because you think that they might be carrying something at the door. You just choose not to do that, right? The optics are far more important than that piece of equipment. But 50%, between 50 and 60% loss because equipment go out, doors they shouldn't go out highly achievable. That's a significant number in your facility. And then just to finish up, um, the rental side of, um, you know, if you're renting equipment you own, if you rent infusion pumps, if you rent SCDs, you rent wound bags, if you rent something you own, you are going to get much better availability of the equipment you own, which means you're not going to rent. Rentals should be for 
total care bariatric beds. They should be for those very specialist pieces of equipment that it doesn't make a lot of sense that you own. So this is your program charter. This is what you sit down with your provider, your vendor, your RTLS partner and say, these are the outcomes we're expecting out of the system. Because if we get the first one right, then all these other issues that impact the financial outcomes of the hospital, the SAT, the HCAPs, the, you know, every impact, this has impact all the way down there. You get this right and you're going to have better outcomes spread all the way through the facility. So um, I'm a little in front of myself here. Uh, so I will quickly sort of talk about what we do from a hardware standpoint. Is that all right, um, my moderators? How are we doing for time? We have time. We have time. We're 31 minutes in, so we have time. Okay. So um, what, you know, I spoke about the prerequisite of getting this right is high confidence, highly accurate, unique space at an affordable price point that doesn't take three years to install, right? So the Cognosis story is we're an AI and machine learning company. Um, that's what we do. And we leverage all of our experience and our knowledge in, in AI and machine learning to drive these outcomes. By using AI and machine learning up in the cloud, uh, we can simplify everything that takes place in the hospital without affecting the accuracy or the outcomes of um, the system. So a very simple install comes at a low price point that's highly accurate, arguably the most accurate platform you can get at one of the lowest price points. That's a pretty good place to be in the middle of that Venn diagram, right? So we're an AI company um, uh, that, that's hosted up in the cloud. What that allows us to do is to put in, oh, um, very simple Bluetooth beacons. Uh, they clip to the ceiling tile rails and they're, so they're up there, they're secure. And these are um, just transmitting their unique ID. Uh, we do not use them directly for location identification of a tag, right? They are reference points that the AI can use to determine where a tag is in the building, right? So a lot of Bluetooth is about connecting a tag to an anchor. They plug an anchor into a power outlet. And if my tag can, can, can connect to that anchor, then we must be close together, right? Um, okay, but it's not in room accurate. It's really challenging to make that any more accurate. And of course, then you're plugging them sort of all over the building to try to pick up a degree of accuracy. So we don't do that. We treat it differently. We have the AI do the processing that allows us location accuracy. So the badge, which is the number item number three, the tag that lives on that piece of equipment, when it moves through the, the hospital and it stops in a hallway, or a patient room, wherever it's moving through the hospital, it is listening out and collecting data from the beacons to send to the AI so the AI can determine where that particular tag is based on the unique combination of beacons it can hear in any particular location. Our staff duress badge, so this is a staff safety badge, works the same way. If I'm working on the floor and I become in a in, in a, uh, a threatening situation, I can um, discreetly hold the button on the back of the badge and that will identify my location to security and that I am in need of assistance. 
all the same architecture. So if you were to roll out and put in asset tracking, you are a shipment of staff badges away from being able to also do duress. And then the final piece of it is a long range gateway. So we do not use Wi-Fi in the hospital, the dedicated backhaul for the system. Now, having said all that, as you all know, AI machine learning needs training. Uh, when you open your laptop up or use your phone, if you do facial recognition, it's gonna take a bunch of photos of you or a bunch of images of your thumb to train that system to identify you. So we do the same thing at the end of the physical installation. We step into each unique space with our configurator, our trainer bot, and we look at the space as it appears to us in the world of BLE. And so a visual representation of that is all these lines are BLE signals that are coming through the walls, the floor, the ceiling, from around the, the hospital into this space. And it makes it a very unique space for the AI to determine that we are absolutely in room 417 or we are absolutely leaning against the wall outside of room 417. So our approach is different. We can drive what is basically in room accuracy in a 20 foot segment of hallway, count equipment in an alcove, we can virtualize a space in the lobby and count wheelchairs or anything else that's uh, in the lobby that you want to be aware of. So um, accuracy at the right price point is really what gives you the chance to automate your power levels. So now I'm really at the end. Oh, great. I had some questions come in and wanted to share those with you. Is it possible to detect a signal from a device inside a steel cabinet, such as an employee locker? Uh, no, yes and no. No is the close enough to the accurate answer. Of course, it's RF um, and steel lockers, a completely sealed steel locker is gonna be really tough to read. Um, if we were trying to find a piece of equipment in a locker room, uh, my app, Oh, actually, I might be able to show you this. Let me drag my phone back over here. Uh, what I would do is I'd walk into that area. I would go to nearby. Oh, I don't have my Bluetooth on, so I might turn my Bluetooth on for me. And that would actually show me what's in the room. Now, if I'm standing close to the locker, chances are I'm going to be able to hear that. Um, but definitely, you know, if you're outside in the hallway, you wouldn't be able to hear that. When um, that, and when then, my go ahead. The next two questions I think you just answered. So it, one of them was what technique is being used to detect the equipment location and tracking it live? And then also how does AI and machine learning help locate the device accurately? Yeah, I think so you just they, answered those. I, I, I did. So um, happy to just really quickly recap on that because they're great questions, but uh, uh, it, it, it's it's for want of a better description, a Bluetooth fingerprint or a Bluetooth um, pattern that is very dissimilar in every part of the hospital. Um, so the picture here, what I'm trying to represent is, you know, the big thick lines are stronger signals, left the top left-hand corner, the bottom right-hand corner, and it has its own unique ID. And then in the background, you've got thinner lines coming in at different angles with their unique IDs and so that their signals are weaker. Um, and, you know, basically the AI can instantly determine what this room is with this amount of information. Right, and then another question we had was, uh, can you please explain more about medical grade tags? Is it required FDA approval? No. So the tag sits outside the device, so it does not in any way um, 
interface into a work with the device. If I was trying to embed my functionality into an infusion pump, um, it would have to go back through FDA. So nobody's ever really done that because of that issue. So they sit on the outside. Um, it's my tag listens for Bluetooth and transmits at 900 megs to the long range gateway. They're all inside of the certified bands, uh, frequency bands that are allocated for use um, inside a hospital. Um, they are the absolute standard BLE frequencies, so the beacons, for instance. And so everybody who walks around the hospital with a phone on is listening to or transmitting a BLE signal. It's all the same. What we do is we filter all the noise out, just listen to our beacons. Um, so there is no certification requirement um, at an FDA level or anything similar required. Great. Um, from what we have seen, RTLS is too expensive. How is this different? Absolutely, it's too expensive. Um, you know, traditional RTLS is too expensive. Uh, lots of cable, uh, lots of devices. If you want room level, you're putting infrared in. Even even the newer breed, I guess, of BLE vendors, um, they'll only be they'll only give you some rough accuracy until you again put infrared into rooms um so yeah it, it has been too expensive but I, I i challenge the notion of expense right is um you know expense there's there's two aspects to expense right there's the cost of putting it in and the deliverable value measurable auditable value of the platform and for too long rtls vendors have been delivering really expensive heavy capital intensive installs and not being able to provide any measurable outcome. So it's a combination of both things, right? So, um, you know, I usually give the example of hospitals are happy to buy MRI machines or build new towers. Um, and that's not too expensive. And that's obviously costs a lot more than, than a tracking system. So it's really a combination of two. So we focus really heavily on the deliverables, having an auditable financial statement delivered quarterly for the financial leadership in the hospital. Fact is, uh, at the right price point, a simple install, no cable pools, not equipment in every room, accuracy everywhere, which is what we deliver. Um, and then the high accuracy outcomes and increased equipment utilization, everything else, this will pay for itself. It will pay for itself for the next five years, right? Um, and we focus really heavily on answering the tough questions at the CFO level. So that doesn't mean, gee, my nurses are much happier. It means we had measurable outcomes um, in hard dollars. This next question goes along with what you just said. And how do I prove the financial value after impl implementation? What are some things that you can help them show, I guess, their leaders? Yeah. So um, first of all, is you know the predominant value of the system is the avoidance of unnecessary spending and capital. It's the um, recovery of spent capital, right? So you have too many infusion pumps. Let's work out what you need clinically. And when I say clinically, it's not just in room on a patient. It is how long does it take to pick it up? to get it cleaned, how long does it take to get it cleaned, how long is it sitting, you know, waiting for distribution. We need to model that entire universe of movement of equipment to really understand what your excess inventory might be. So a simple example is, and it's a dumb example, it's an over-exaggeration, but imagine if every time I pick up a syringe pump and sent it down to SPD, they took six weeks to clean it you'd have such a backlog you have to have extra equipment to take into account the backlog right so we're looking at all aspects of equipment in a hospital and then you still get excess inventory a lot of it um, so monetization of the excess inventory is what drives this and so identification of excess inventory proving that out 
which is really simple. You take it out of circulation and see if it makes any difference in the hospital. Redistribution into your clinics, um, your, your ambulatory centers, anywhere that's looking to buy five infusion pumps, I have them in stock. There you go, I just saved the organization a substantial amount of money. Um, that's, the, that's a key one. The second one is loss. Um, we will help you recover a lot of equipment that would normally walk out the door. And we capture that and document that. Um, and, and then of course, rentals, uh, the other primary category for hard dollars. And, and then in the end, we're going to deliver that report to you every 90 days because you all have a day job and we do this all the time, right? So every 90 days, we're going to sit down, we're going to have a business review. What was that 90 days like? How are we looking at excess inventory? What did we have sitting clean and idle and available during this 90 day period? Um, any sort of bottlenecks, any challenges we saw, any adjustment to the profile levels we may we might recommend, all part of the discussion. Right. And then someone asked, how many independent hospital systems have successfully deployed your system? Uh, so we are in five facilities and starting or about to start rolling out a fairly large health system and probably in about 30 days, that's going to be public. So I unfortunately can't say anything on that right now. Um, but yeah, we're in, um, we're in five with a sixth one being installed in Flushing, New York. And then um, we're about to have a pretty large system level rollout, which I'm looking forward to announcing. Fantastic. I hope you'll share that with Tech Nation so we can put it in the magazine. Absolutely. Oh. But um, just really quickly, the largest single footprint we have is the University of Tennessee Medical Center, 1.8 million square feet. Um, so that's uh, that's been live about 12 months. That's the largest single hospital that, that we have installed at the moment. Okay. Um, someone asked, how can we get support from other teams inside the hospital to get this approved? Fantastic question. Um, so a couple of different ways, what we would, uh, what we normally do is we help you pull together a business case, um, which includes being on site and meeting with the departments and really generating excitement and energy from the various different departments in as far as them understanding what, how they value, how they're going to benefit from this, right? So if you talk to senior nursing leadership and you show them how we're going to our focus is we're going to make sure that there isn't a single moment in time all year that your team will not have access to clean equipment they're going to sign on on the spot right um, clearly i'll have to explain how it gets done but they're going to jump at that that's that's one of their big beefs right um financial leadership uh, we've got a comprehensive model that runs through how the value is generated, what our expected outcomes are. And I have stood in front of a, and, and been heavily scrutinized by a lot of CFOs at a sister hospital and system level over time. And it will pass through that process. Uh, but, you know, every facility, your facility is unique. Um, we'll spend time with you building a facility unique um, projection on value, um, bring the team of people in to support the initiative. Here is the key here. We only need 20 people in your organization to use it, to do everything we spoke about, right? I don't need 500 nurses using the app. They'll have it. Maybe they're looking for a bladder scanner or something or a mobile patient lift that they're in short supply. And they can absolutely go to the app and search for something, but mostly they won't. 20 core people um, within the organization are the team to get clean equipment into all the right areas in the hospital in a timely manner. That's it. 
you get 20 people bought into the project and the entire organization is going to run more efficiently for it. So that's how that's how this gets done. Just had another question come in and then we'll wrap things up. Any questions we don't get to, we'll email to you so you can follow up with them. Um, what is the cost of equipment badge and how long does the battery last? Is the battery replaceable? Another great question. Um, okay, so we're a services company, so I don't sell you anything, right? We, You're gonna tell me what to track. I have a monthly fee for that. And that's how we have our relationship. Um, the best part of all that is you're not buying equipment that three years from now you're looking to replace. That's my job. Um, the batteries in the tags last uh, between two and three PM cycles. And I'm very specific when I talk about that because we will never have you searching for tags in between PM cycles. The time to make replacements for a battery is during a PM. We are always on the hook to provide you batteries at no charge, right? So part of our QBR is that we'll have a look, you know, two years from now, you're about to do um, uh, feeding pumps. And we have a look at that, you know, because we can see this remotely. We have a look at all the battery levels and we decide it will not go through another 12 months to the next PM. Could be nine months, it could be two months, but it won't last until you touch it again. I'm going to ship you, no questions asked, the batteries replace in the tags. So about a minute's work, coin cell, flip it out, put a new one in. Um, you shouldn't have to buy batteries. The infrastructure, the beacons are the same. They're double A batteries, they have a five to 10 year battery life, but you will never touch one. You'll never buy batteries. That is in solely my responsibility. So you're buying a solution. Bill, thank you so much. That was sounds like a really cool solution. I know a lot of people could use. Um, thanks again for your time today. And I'd like to encourage everyone to visit the sponsor's website, cognosis.com, C-O-G-N-O-S-O-S.com. As promised, answer to today's trivia question is, the Atlanta Hawks. So congratulations to our winner, Jason Chaffin with Common Spirit in Texas. We'll be in touch with you to give you your um, AirPods. Now a quick reminder that you can obtain your CE certification by completing the post webinar survey. The survey will be emailed in about one hour. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE credit from the ACI and you will be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We will be back next month with another Tools of the Trade live demo and another great prize as we continue to celebrate our 10th anniversary of webinars. Visit webinarwednesday.live for more details, a complete schedule of all upcoming webinars and complimentary registration. And don't forget to log on and nominate a colleague or yourself for the 40 under 40. Thank you and have a great day.